Um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for uh, coming in quite considerable numbers to be with me. Uh, I'm always very touched and very grateful and rather surprised that people come to hear something as esoteric and uh, uh, zany as this. Uh, so you see, I'm always in a state of gratitude and humility. Um, I have to begin, really, by uh, qualifying um, what will be said and what will not be said and what uh, territories I will enter and what ter are territories I will not enter. Um, since uh, we are becoming incredibly sensitive um, to you know, what boundaries are and what boundaries are not these days. Um, ritual is a hoary topic, H-O-A-R-Y, um, uh, simply because everybody seems to want to be able to own this space uh, called ritual. Uh, since it is a space in which we can command and we can control. Um, uh, we, however, work in a, in a space where ritual is uh, at once very ebullient, uh, very vibrant, very chaotic and anarchic, uh, yet having a certain kind of aesthetic order. Uh, and um, I'm going to delve into some of these things uh, into the realms of spirituality, uh, less than theology, although spirituality is also now a very appropriated term. Uh, and we shall try to, 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 to clarify uh, and interrogate what some of the aspects of language are. Uh, a lot of my talk will dwell on language uh, because I think it's one of the most political uh, areas these days. Uh, and yet one of those areas in which we are very, very far uh, removed. Uh, I'm not delving into theology, uh, though that's an area that is well within competency, uh, but uh, it is a fractious and um, uh, it's a very uncertain um, uh, realm uh, these days. Uh, what we are really going to do is try and interrogate the nature of ritual in particular kinds of contexts. Uh, with quite a bit of storytelling, with quite a bit of description. Uh, in my last talk, um, I ended by uh, referring to a book that I am very, very fond of, uh, a book called Music and Trance, uh, written by a marvelous anthropologist called Gilbert Rouget, uh, who did work in Haiti and he did work in Benin uh, with trance drummers. Uh, it's a marvelous 320-page study that answers no questions, uh, but raises even more questions, uh, and posits this quite remarkable intellectual position, uh, position of uh, not having scholastic uh, resolutions to things, but really to talk about how uh, those scholastic resolutions uh, must be directly experienced. Uh, so it is a book full of really vivid, wonderful literary descriptions. And hardly anything is said about music and trance. Uh, he starts off with that question, why does music engender trance? Uh, and then he goes into about 300 and beautiful pages of descriptions of, of Benin trance drummers and of voodoo in, in Haiti, uh, and ends up with the conclusion that I don't know. <laughs> but I can picture a little bit about what actually happens. Uh, and so there's going to be a, quite a bit of that uh, here. What I find uh, as I work deeper and further uh, into the psychology of these traditional communities, how they address psychology, uh, because when we talk about ritual, especially within a traditional Malay uh, therapeutic context, uh, we are essentially talking about healing, and we are talking about opening space, opening up of spaces that end up in great complexity only to end up in very basic, rudimentary, foundational ideas. How do we breathe? Uh, how do we get along with each other? Uh, what is the nature of the equili equilibrium between me, the individual, uh, with my own temperament and my own mood and my own individuality? And how do we form a form of balance uh, with a larger community? Uh, what do we take away 
what do we give? Uh, and it's also a very deep interrogation into the idea of space. What kind of space is used for what? Um, so, you know, I was always very intrigued when we were having this huge debate about Asian values back in the 90s uh, with our former Prime Minister, Dr. Mahadeer, and his counterpart, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, talking about the fact that there was no such thing as individuality in Asian societies. And that is what distinguished us from the West. Uh, and yet, uh, this was the beginning years of my foray into, into uh, the Malay ritual world. Uh, and I began to discover that, you know, that was a complete farce <laughs> because there was so much about individuality uh, that is explored in the Malay uh, world uh, and in a lot of Asian societies in lots of ritual contexts. Uh, I'm not one of those who's into all these uh, new ageist ideas of unity of faiths and all that, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but uh, uh, I do believe there are great arcs. Uh, so that language, again, becomes very important. Uh, you can use a state, uh, a term, a very Christian, mystical term and phrase like a state of grace and apply it very much to Muslim, Malay Muslim communities uh, who, who practice mind putri in, uh, uh, in, in Kelantan. But uh, uh, before I start, um, let me just show you a, a very brief video. I'm not going to have so many visual illustrations. Somebody's got to keep the time because, uh, you know, once you get into ritual mode, then you just, you're angin, you know. Um, so maybe we can just play the uh, video first, just to give people a sense. <laughs> examples uh, of, of those things. Uh, these are communities largely in what you would call rural, these days semi-rural areas. Uh, and uh, what was featured was the Main Putri, which is perhaps uh, the most uh, foundational uh, trance dance uh, tradition that exists uh, among the Malays in the state of Kelantan. It is uh, largely and almost solely a healing tradition. Uh, a therapeutic tradition, and you saw uh, aspects of the Mak Yong, uh, and uh, that is a ritual called the Sama Angin, where essentially women, large, mainly women, uh, you know, uh, culminate, do a performance of the Mak Yong and culminate in a state of release or lepas um, right at the end. Um, then you, we had uh, the, the, orang, uh, the Mahmeri communities of Pulau Keri uh, doing their Puja Pantai. Uh, which is done every around the time of Ch Chinese uh, New Year, uh, a very community bonding uh, uh, ritual. Then you saw the Manora, which is a Thai Buddhist, um, uh, Thai Buddhist Malay in Kelantan. It's Thai Buddhist Malay in Kedah. It's largely Thai in Penang. It's Thai Buddhist Malay and uh, Chinese. Um, and that is Malaysia. Uh, I think the last time uh, we had uh, quite a bit of, of um, debate about the kind of term that you use, uh, and I'd use the, the term bastard to describe Malaysian culture. Uh, uh, wonderful bastardy. Uh, I need to find a more refined term, but for the moment, let's stick with that. 
uh, wild and uncontrollable, uncontrolled, uh, and basically spaces kind of immersing one into the other. Um, and then we have, of course, the Indian uh, temple drumming tradition called the Urumi Melam. Uh, and I would like to use the Indian to compare it uh, later with uh, how uh, ideas of trance and how ideas of, of ecstasy, um, which are basically the same kind of experiences uh, for the individual, quite different uh, when they are culturally perceived. But let me start off by referring to two Englishmen. <laughs> Um, they are poets. Uh, I don't often fall back on Englishmen, but these are two poets that I really love. Uh, and someone's got to tell me what time I stop. What time do I stop? Sorry? 4.50. That's only half an hour. Okay, because... Sorry? Okay, until 5. Okay. Um, okay. Um, w. H. Auden. W. H. Auden. Uh, had something to say about the writing of poetry. Uh, and he said, um, you know, whenever I get someone come up to me and say, I want to be a poet, I ask him why. And if he says, because I have so much to say, I tell him to go and do something else. But when someone comes up to me and says the same thing, and I reply in the same way, and he says, because I'm entranced by the magic of words, and I am lost in the sound of words, then I know this is a poet that really can be. Uh, the other Englishman is a man who is so central in my creative life. Uh, he is more respected and venerated than read. Uh, and his name is Geoffrey Hill. Um, and Geoffrey Hill is, to me, I call him my desert father a great guide and teacher. Uh, and uh, late in his life, just before he died, Jeffrey Hill was asked, how come he went through this new found um, you know, proliferation of poetry where he used to write seven poems a year? He now wrote seven poems a week. And he thought on it for a very long time. And he has this wonderful Desert Father face, you know, very sage-like, frowning, full of furrows and furrows and and then he looked at the camera and said, it's, it's all a mystery. Um, now, as we get into aspects of ritual, I think it's very important to maintain that sense that you cannot ever know. Uh, and that ritual is all so much focused on things like intuition. Uh, it's very, very focused into things of aspects of sublimity, of ecstasy. Uh, now, listen to the words I'm using. Sublime, uh, ecstatic, uh, rapture. Uh, these are words that are only half believed in our context. Yeah. Uh, in this very rational, rationalized, uh, I don't want to use the word secular because secular is actually quite, quite uh, uh, a... a um, convoluted and complicated term. But in this highly rationalized age, we only half believe in words like the spirit, um, which is so central to ritualistic traditions, uh, when we talk of the winds. Um, so we appear in these days, in the contemporary context of rituals, uh, to come from two points. Uh, one is one of opposition and one of wanting to control uh, the practice and performance of, of rituals. Uh, and a lot of this goes into rationalizing things like faith. So you hear self-made gurus uh, talk about things like, well, karma is proved in physics. Uh, evolution, uh, karma is actually evolution, part of science. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you bend in a certain way in prayer, you know, now biology has proved that it's good for your spine or something like that. Uh, lots of this goes on at the moment. If you eat certain kinds of food, it's, you know, the bio food industry or whatever tells you that it's actually very good, whereas we Indians knew it like 25,000 years ago, right? Um, 
it's also uh, a space in which increasingly very political forces are trying to appropriate the practice of rituals, determine what is a valid ritual, what is a legitimate ritual, and what is not. The second is an appropriation that is taking place. Uh, that is the new ageization uh, of a lot of aspects that are found in, in ritual, like the word spirituality. Uh, and highly commodified these days, uh, sold essentially to people suffering from a great deal of boredom, a great deal of alienation, and a great deal of ennui, yeah. existential boredom. Uh, I was a student at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, at once a very radical institution, yet the most orientalist of institutions, uh, established and set up by a scholar administrator who served most of his life in Malaya, whose name was Richard Winstead, set up the School in Oriental African Studies. And uh, in the middle of winter, uh, I used to find lots of mainly Indian, young Indian boys, you know, Arjun from Trincomani or something, uh, looking with great consternation at Kate from Kent, uh, who was kind of peddling about with no shoes, wearing a badly played salva kameez with a bindi on her head uh, in the depths of winter. Uh, so this kind of appropriation of ritual, you, you, you kind of know what I'm uh, talking about. Um, there is also, within this space now, quite an interesting um, revelation about how people try to uh, see a transition of rituals. Right? Uh, we have a couple of paintings that perhaps I could show and you all could view in the course uh, that uh, indicate very much uh, the enduring appeal of rituals, though not performed today, uh, and though figures are getting more and more obsolete of ritual, still have a very enduring uh, memory and effect uh, on the contemporary arts and, and, and contemporary uh, uh, practitioners of the arts. In fact, one of the things that I'd always wanted to do with Pusaka, and I wanted to work with Joe on this, and uh, maybe it's about time uh, we actually get around to it, uh, was in the, all the years that I was reviewing Malaysian theatre and so on, uh, I was very disappointed that I never got a sense of, of place uh, in the contemporary actor, uh, of a certain kind of primordiality of place in the contemporary actor. Uh, Malaysia is actually quite unique in this, uh, in our inability and disregard and really disinterest in interrogating our own traditions. Um, so paintings were, were a little more interesting uh, uh, for me. Uh, we had uh, Ibrahim Hussein, uh, the, the, one of our great painters, Ibrahim Hussein, um, who, you know, he had one eye. He was blind in one eye. He, was, he had only one eye. And he could be able to conjure paintings in, in, in overnight. Huge, large canvas. And they were always full of what you would call in the traditional Malay world, angin. And the myth among his contemporaries, and he was, you know, kind of isolated from his contemporaries. He made a life of his own, never really joined anybody. Uh, so you may have called it a, a bit of envy, maybe a bit of... Uh, but they always said that Ibrahim Hussein possessed a hantu, right? or kept a jinn, or a ghost. Uh, because how could a one-eyed one, one man create something like this? But I worked with Ibrahim Hussein on his uh, memoirs. And I asked him one day, I said, the first question I actually asked him, and uh, Ibrahim Hussein was always very interested in talking about celebrity, that he had hung out with Andy Warhol, and that he had you know, danced with the Pointer Sisters, and things like that. Uh, one aspect of him that I just couldn't be bothered about and really bored me. But uh, I asked him directly, I said, do you have an ancestry that deals with shamanism? And he was quite taken aback. And he said, uh, oh yeah, actually my grandfather was a Silat uh, a practitioner. And the rumor in Kedah was that my grandfather kept a pet tiger. And the, it was the tiger that protected him wherever he went. And that's how his story begins in the memoir, if you're able to get it these days. Um, this notion of the, um, the bequest 
of hereditary, of memory, of lineage, uh, all the stuff of Malay rituals yeah, uh, is here in this very contemporary painter who never thought about it uh, because he was thinking about the Pointer Sisters and uh, Andy Warhol, but nevertheless appeared to be the very thing that urged him every time he picked up a brush and painted one of these uh, uh, marvelous things. Uh, so we have a few images. Can I have uh, the Bomo? Is Jai? Jai is not here. Yeah, uh, this one's over that side. Um, I'm very drawn to this uh, because Bomo Hujan, uh, it's a very contemporary depiction of the Bomo in a very contemporary pose. But this appeal of the Bomo uh, has still not gone away. Uh, and in fact, it has metamorphosed into uh, something quite mutant from what it actually is. Right? Uh, so when you talk about bomos these days, you're essentially talking about people of the, of, of the dark arts. Uh, whereas there are so many categories of bomo uh, within the traditional setting. Uh, the healer, uh, essentially the, uh, um, the therapist, uh, and not just one who dabbles in the dark and magical arts, although they also exist. Uh, but today, BOMOs exist mostly uh, in high-level Malay politics. Uh, yeah, they're planting things under your chair all the time. Uh, uh, the next one is by uh, Khairuddin Zainuddin, I think. No, that's... Uh, yes, this artwork um, is by Nick Zainal Abidin, Nick Mohamad Saleh. A Klantanese uh, who spent his life basically um, animating uh, so much of Klantan culture. Um, this is one of my favorite of his works. This is the Klantanese Minato. Um, and uh, so much in the aspect of, uh, of the Malay world is mimesis. And uh, the uh, projection uh, of animal powers into the human being. Uh, I think I mentioned last time that our great Manora dancer was believed to actually be a wild boar uh, and turn into a wild boar uh, at certain parts, uh, um, certain parts of the day, things like that. Uh, uh, yeah, and I'd like to thank uh, Charmaine, and this is from Dato, the late Dato Paname uh, um collection. Uh, the next one? Yes, this is perhaps one of my favorite uh, paintings, uh, drawings, uh, impressions uh, um, in all of Malaysian art. This is the Babi Rusa by my dear friend who is supposed to be here but is not, uh, Ahmad Zaki Anwar. Um, now, it's illustrative, uh, kind of like Albrecht Dürer, Dürer uh, anatomical drawings, uh, and yet with Zaki it's not because it's deeply interrogative. Uh, it's deeply interrogative and uh, I uh, really look at Zaki and a lot of his animal paintings as being the expression of the Therian, you know, the Therian being the person who um, identifies very much with animal beings, um, kind of like me, uh, very much so. So there's a lot of this, I think, energy, uh, there's a lot of memory and there's a lot of recollection uh, of ritual even within the modern context. But what is very interesting is that I think a lot of the uh, uh, painters and performers who do channel these things uh, don't actually realize what they're doing or where the source is. Uh, and Joe was, is actually one of them. Uh, and for years, uh, I've reviewed her, I've always talked about this very primordial thing that comes out in her when she uh, um, performs. Okay, let's get back to talking a little bit about ritual, what it is, uh, what its operation is in traditional and traditional Malay culture. Again, I use the word traditional in a very loose way. Uh, so much of what is traditional has now metamorphosed into so many other things, and we can talk about that a little too. Uh, but ritual, what we understand is what we perform, uh, maybe to a higher being, uh, some of us think. Uh, other people just think it's what I do every day to discipline myself and to order my day. Um, but uh, there's something uh, that is 
a kind of distillation that I like very much, and it comes from a university. I'm not fond of the academy, but uh, one of these, uh, this, 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 this description I think is very good. And this is from the Journal of Ritual Studies, very, very fine journal. Uh, and it says, ritual studies is a distinct academic field that gives special attention to the performance aspects of the rites of something. It may be religious, uh, it, it may be personal, it may be in the paying of debts uh, and things like that. But the operative word in this uh, definition for me is performance. Because very people, few people think of us every day as being performers. Yet when we go to the mosque or the temple, we are engaging in a kind of performance rite. Um, I think the great disruption, and I will use the word disruption a lot, rituals have not gone away. Those energies and those primordial needs and longings have not gone away. But they have become very disrupted. Uh, and I think there are lots of other forces that are at play uh, that are looking essentially to consume and subsume um, uh, the ritualistic dimension, which is really the primordial dimension uh, of uh, human beings, uh, really. Um, let's go then fall back on uh, the Malay world. Um, where it is today, what it was before, and essentially what the great disruption is. Um, if you go to Kelantan, where we do a lot of our work, but also in Johor uh, and in Kedah, in many of the places that we do our work, within a ritual setting, um, we are quite afraid of the word ritual. And so when people refer to Pusaka, they say we, do, we work in traditional theatre. And I always clarify it by saying, actually, we work in ritual theatre. Uh, so don't be afraid of entering that space uh, and all the polemics that comes uh, uh, with it. Right? Uh, when you enter the Klantan space, uh, ritual space, you enter a dimension, and this is another word we are very afraid to use. We don't use it or we use it in very New Ages terms. We enter a very esoteric space. Esoteric esoteric being, that which can be held, be held, but that is not always intelligible. Not always intelligible. And is grounded in the experiential rather than the intellectual, sometimes. Um, so, when you enter the space and you work with Mark Young actors or Mind Putri actors, um, what are some of the intellectual frameworks that they operate in? Uh, first of all, the ritual context is really enveloped by the notion of God. But God as being, uh, you know, a completely in, in uh, for Muslims, God has 99 names. And these 99 names have an operative place in every part of a performance. Uh, and Every performance is open with an invocation and an affirmation of the faith. Yeah? Uh, so I can't say it now, otherwise I'd be declared a Muslim, but <laughs> you know, I, I profess that I am, yeah, and Muhammad is my, right? Um, and after that, things unravel and undulate. Um, there are two aspects to a performance and a performer and a ritualistic context that is very, very important. One is this notion of ilmu lua, outer knowledge. Uh, and outer knowledge is the exhibitionist part of the performer. Hmm? Things that can be learnt, things that can be crafted, hmm? things that can be shaped. But the ilmu lua cannot be fully consummated if there is no ilmu dalam, or inner knowledge. This is esoteric knowledge. Uh, and it's basically the concordance between the two. Uh, your inner knowledge, um, contemplative, introspective, self-interrogating, 
that corresponds to you know, how you are shaped as a performer. Um, and these are all driven by another two concepts uh, that operate very much, not just in the Klantanese world, but in the Malay world, uh, which is what God has given you in terms of your character and personality. Yeah. Uh, this is a term very loosely used as angin or wind. And angin could be a whole variety of things. For one, it is your essential temperament and mood, who you are as a person. Angin could also mean desire. And what I really love within the ritualistic setting is that it is free of a kind of judgmental morality because everything has its place. Uh, in, the world, in, in, in the Malay world today, you have this concept of nafsu as being something that is undesirable, uh, bad, uh, sometimes even evil. Nafsu is desire or lust. Yeah. Within the ritual context, again, it has a particular space and a particular place that requires expression. Mm. Um, <clears throat> the operation between uh, the, the, the mood, the angin, uh, and the essential spirit or semangat, we use that word a lot of the time, but again, today in Malay, the word semangat is looked at with a bit of derision uh, and uh, disapproval. Um, because basically semangat means your essential spirit. Yeah. Uh, and um, living, just living, being who you are, requires a great deal of a balancing act. The interaction between the two, the mood and the spirit, uh, is very essential for individual and community equilibrium. Yeah? Uh, and very often, it's the community that provides a space, performance space, uh, for healing, and Joe and I were just talking about it because these days we talk about the arts as, as having patrons, uh, you know, ministry controlled and things like that. Uh, when at one time it was all community supported, uh, and uh, it was not just about money. Sometimes it was just about having a dinner or uh, some tobacco and rice and th things like that. And you would come essentially to heal a person um, within a tradition. Uh, uh, a ritual context by doing a wayang kulit or a mayong or a or a or a, or a mind putri, um, and illness basically was not about breaking your legs or having cancer, because then the shaman will just tell you, I think you know that's hospital kubang krayan. Please go there. I can't do anything about this. Uh, but it really is about um, uh, depression, about mental states, about. Uh, uh, um, feeling down about, uh, uh, you know, and sometimes those cases can, can get very extreme. Uh, and really to bringing out into the open whatever you may be feeling inside or indoors. So this notion of the interior and the exterior and the performance space as being that place where both of these things meet uh, is very, very critical. Uh, and um, the therapeutic context is all about uh, the spiritual realm. There is also the realm of the magic arts, but that does, is not involved in things like mind putri. These are very interior uh, things that uh, revolve around spells and uh, uh, you know the black arts, basically mind jinn and all that kind of thing. Uh, the the one of the major problems you've had over the past thirty years with the proscription of many of these um, uh, ritual performances, like wayang kulit and ma yong, they're all actually now proscribed. Um, uh, although, you know, that's, that's just in, 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 in uh, legislation, uh, but the culture is still thriving, continues to thrive, um, because people need it. Uh, one of the very great dangers that has happened with this proscription, uh, and it comes, of course, from uh, um, religion, it comes from uh, political, politicized religion, it comes from the politicization of culture, is the fact that there these two aspects of rituals are not distinguished. So the aspect of the therapeutic and the healing has now become confused uh, with the other aspect of shamanism, which is magic uh, and the dark arts. Right? So if you actually look at the original legislation that was passed uh, in the Klantan State Assembly in 1992, uh, banning all of these traditions, uh, you will find you know, pretty 
I think general things like, well, women are not supposed to be on stage, uh, you know, and then you can't cross-dress, you can't... And all of this happens, of course. Uh, all of this happens because of angin, right? Uh, because, of, you know, we, we are not just one thing. We are so many different things. Um, but what these edicts do is they force us to be only one thing uh, and take away all the complexity. Not just in Klantan or the Malay world, this is happening uh, kind of everywhere and with, with, with everything. Um, so the performance space then is sustained by the community uh, because if you allow an individual to get into a state of deep depression, uh, into a state of sometimes even madness, uh, then you, know, you would have lots of problems uh, within a very tightly organized and highly, uh, um, a hierarchy of, uh, you know, village life is not uh, chaotic and mad, it's actually established along very strong hierarchies. And if you have a disruptive factor, it becomes very, very uh, troubling uh, to the community. Uh, we've had instances, uh, for example, where we were asked to occasion or organize a Mak Yong performance for a young man who was deeply depressed and was calling out to his ancestors. Every night he was calling out to his ancestors. Uh, this was the early days in Pusaka when there was no money at all. <laughs> uh, so in, during the course of us trying to raise these funds, this boy hung himself. Mm. Um, there is another uh, very interesting thing that I experienced. And this uh, really distinguishes uh, those two realms I was talking about, the realm of uh, the therapeutic and then the realm of magic. Uh, and uh, in the 90s, 1990s, there was a very famous island uh, off the Klantan River uh, that was extremely famous uh, for having master artists. Uh, it was a place called Kampong Telok Ranjuna. Uh, Kampong Telok Ranjuna is about uh, maybe 300 meters, 500 meters from uh, um, PCB, which is the main Kota Baru coast. It's called Pantai Cahaya Bulan today. But in the 90s, it was called Pantai Cinta Brahi. Uh, Pantai Cinta Brahi being the beach of, the beach of passionate love. <laughs> today, it's just called the beach of moonshine or moonlight or whatever it is. Uh, and um, it was very interesting because uh, you had to get to a fishing jetty and then take a rather ramshackle boat uh, and then travel across the river into this village. And then you discover in this small island uh, was just a trove of performing arts. You know, the greatest rabab player was there. The greatest toputri was there. One of the great Mark Yong actresses was there. Uh, and uh, yeah, our great Raja Gandang drama, you know, Pat Raman now passed already. He lived on that island. Which Malaysian would know this? Let alone anybody, you know, coming from abroad, unless you really entered that kind of kinship uh, network. But uh, it was a very interesting experience for me because they would have these performances at night, and there was one particular performance that I was really urged to come and see. Uh, and it was the attempted healing of a young man who had been possessed. Yeah, uh, Apparently, he had jilted a, a, a marriage and you know, she had gone to a momo who had... Uh, and so he would get into these states, rather aggressive states, uh, kind of resembling Amok, but not to that extent. You know? And it would come in in, in ebbs and flows. Uh, but apparently the characteristic of him in this state was that he would roll his eyes so that he'd only get eye white. Uh, something you see quite often in Malay horror films, uh, eye white. Um, now that wasn't so harrowing for me. What was harrowing was the fact that uh, I had to park my car <laughs> and walk 100 meters through very dense and thick jungle, which was okay when I was going for the performance because it was still light. But uh, when you're coming back at 
you don't know what's sitting at the top of the tree, right? Um, but uh, so I went for this performance. It lasted all of eight hours, uh, and I think I slept through most of it. Uh, but right at the end, when they brought out the patient, you know, I was, I was shaken and, and, and woken. And this is a lovely thing about the ritual context. You don't have to watch everything. Yeah, you don't have to watch everything. Uh, in fact, it's quite boring when you watch everything. Uh, it's a great burden on the performer because he has to perform everything. But the audience doesn't have to watch. So <laughs> you will go, if you go to Klantan, the traditional context, you will find at a particular part of a Wayang Kulit, there's no audience. Because uh, it's dull for them, right? Boring. And then they all come back, converge back at, at, the, at the time. Um, uh, which is why I find, you know, sitting down in a modern context performance increasingly difficult uh, to do. Uh, and performers have to be really riveting, you know? Really riveting. Uh, otherwise, I tend to fall asleep all the time. Uh, so I was woken up and this boy was brought out. Very aggressive. Very, very aggressive. Uh, very frightening. And I'd never ever been frightened ever before seeing... Not even frightening, but just, just you know, it's kind of uh, seram, lah, the Malay word, seram, you know? Kind of like... Uh, and the eye white and everything. Uh, uh, and they couldn't control it. So these were two antithetical approaches to the ritual. Mm -hmm. And the more reasoned, uh, the more... Uh, subdued, the more seductive approach, which always wins uh, in a particular kind of context, simply could not win here. And it was very interesting. What did they do in the end to tame this, this orang lia, you know, really wild person? Was they brought a boy. They brought a five-year-old boy who had just been initiated into the silat tradition. And they brought the five-year-old boy to perform a silat, which is a martial arts thing, with this possessed a man. It was this little boy who was able to bring that individual to some state of calm and tranquility. Now, that struck me. It also struck me that way on the other side, across the Malacca Straits into the Malabar Seas, there is an amazing tradition in Kerala called the Narasimha Jayanti. It is performed, and Narasimha is an especially ferocious, ferocious uh, avatar of the god Vishnu, right? Sent down on earth, essentially, to kill uh, an unjust king. And the uh, Narasimha Jayanti is uh, amazing in the sense that the performer is locked up for 10 days. And throughout that 10 days, anger, rage, and uh, um, yeah, everything associated with anger, rage of the gods is kind of seduced. You know, he's made every day to feel uh, greater and greater rage uh, until he's finally let out. Uh, and then they do this incredible performance and uh, ritual. But he can't be tamed by anybody. The only person who can tame the actor now in full trance, so he goes into trance over a period of 10 days, is a little boy. Uh, so they will bring on a child who will then essentially placate and you know, bring this performer to a state of restitution. So the child, as an aspect of the innocent, uh, to tame, essentially, monsters uh, seems to operate yeah, in, in so many different uh, uh, places. Okay. Um, maybe we can show a scene of the Mind Putri. Yeah, so the point, I mean, this is very, you know, this goes on for six to eight hours. I'm really running out of time, man. I'm not like, I'm, 
only quarter into my way. Uh, okay, I'm going to ru rush here. Hurry, hurry things up, okay? Um, um, yeah, so we want to... Uh, what is that? Okay. Um, women are, play a central role in Kelantan anyway, in, in ritual traditions. Um, women in Kelantan have historically, uh, not formally, but in practice, Kelantan is very much a matrilineal society. Women command everything, they dominate everything. Polyandry was very, very common in Kelantan at one time. In fact, when I met, first met the great Mark Yong actress uh, Che Ning, uh, who was eight generations in a line of great Mark Yong actresses from Patani, and then she was an Orang Larian, you know, she was uh, an exile from Patani. Uh, I met her, she was in her 60s, she was very wizened and old, but she was the sexiest thing I'd ever seen in my life, seriously. Uh, and, and talking about all that esoteric power and so on. And then my, uh, Chek Ning brought me to her house and introduced me to her husbands. Seven of them. Uh, and that night we performed a uh, 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 performance and I realized that the seven husbands were her seven musicians. They earned nothing beyond what she would give them, right? Uh, I never went into the realm of, you know, what the, what the matrimonial arrangements were, uh, but um, it was always uh, so empowering and wonderful for me, uh, who was then a political reporter. Yeah, I was doing a lot of this work while being a political reporter. And everything in Kelantan was about, you know, Taliban, you know, we're going to go into... Uh, you know, Iranian mode and women are this and women are that. Uh, in paper, yes. But in practice, no. And it was the traditional setting that, again, uh, gave me so much of a sense of the feminine aspect uh, of not just Kelantan culture, but of Malay and Southeast Asian culture uh, everywhere. Uh, and this is how a Mark Yong performance is organized. Um, you have a patient, and uh, you don't know what the patient is suffering from. So you can only kind of guess. And they have all these various variety of angin, right? Angin dewa muda, angin dewa pencil, you know, the ostentatious angin, uh, the shriveled angin, the insecure. Uh, you know, so how do we treat this kind of patient? Uh, so the story is only decided once more information has come about the state of the nature of this person's illness. Um, about what kind of story to perform. So they would, performance would start at about 9, 9.30 at night after Maghrib prayers, after the last prayers are done. Uh, and the consultation will be done around 5 o'clock. And it's very nice to see there will always be about 4 to 5 real grand Mark Yong actresses. And they will be sitting right in the middle and having very profound and very intimate conversations about what story would fit most uh, for this patient. And they would be surrounded in a circle by all the men who just listen to them and nod their heads and never say anything. Right. Um, very, very illustrative to me. And then once you get into the performance space, of course, um, a lot of the patients are women. Uh, do we have a clip of the Mak Yong? Uh, and so, uh, don't, don't play it yet. So what you normally get is the unfolding of the Mark Yong performance, which is highly, highly structured. So performance, uh, performers are brought onto stage. They perform a particular ritual called the Meng Hadap Rabab. And in the performance of all of these things is a great deal of symbolism and metaphor. Uh, so, you know, why the Rabab? Well, the rubab uh, basically has a wailing sound. It's the sound of the first mother calling out to her child. Okay? Uh, and whenever you lose, you are in a state of depression, essentially what you are losing is you're losing a sense of yourself. And the best way to recall a sense of yourself is to recall your ancestry. Yeah? 
and the ancestry goes all the way back to Nabi Adam, the first man. Right? So it is first a recollection and remembrance of your family, of your ancestry, and then your humanity. And the rubab is believed to be made from the spine of the prophet Adam. And that has the healing power. to, to uh, And it has a really... Uh, it has an element on the, left, on, the, on the left side, which is called the susu, which is a nipple. Right? So it's, you, you return back uh, to the source. Uh, all these things are regarded today within more formal and official settings as pornographic. That's the word used, huh? Pornographic. Um, and most of the patients are women. Apart from this one man, actually, uh, who was really kind of crazy. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you talk to Toputris, and, you, and they will always tell you that if the man is a patient, they're always like this. Okay, because the, man, the male uh, principal uh, has no sense of center. Right? Uh, and in, within the Klantani's aesthetic tradition, uh, the aesthetic curve is always feminine and female. Uh, so a dalang is judged according to how well he performs a female character. You know, if he's famous for performing a Hanuman or, or Ravana or something, yeah, okay, you know, he's dramatic, and, but he's ugly. Ugly performer, okay? As compared to a refined halus kind of performer. Uh, so, yes, a lot of the healing rituals are done for women. Uh, and as I said, they culminate into a kind of release, right? Uh, and it is believed that essentially the original ancestry enters the body of... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, emerges emerges from the body of the, of the performer in this, uh, or the patient in this state of trance. And they enter into a state of great ecstasy. And there are further explanations about the ecstasy, which I can't go into here. Tiger spirits and things like that, you know. Angin hala, uh, right? But um, I will show you some. But let me tell you a little bit about trance states here so that we don't get confused. And it's very, very important for us to understand certain cultural approaches to something called trance. And it's often rooted in the belief system. Uh, scientists uh, or psychologists, somebody Freudian, would understand it in a totally intellectually, intellectual context. But I have a very... Um, uh, my foot in two kinds of traditions. Um, one is the Klantan tradition of what is the state of trance, what is this elevated state. And the other is a Hindu tradition uh, of which I am a practitioner uh, and uh, I'm a Kali Bhakta. Uh, nobody gets more ferocious as a, as a Kali uh, Bhakta, but uh, you look at the, um, yeah, that's the Urumi Melum, which drumming tradition. Uh, very much associated with working-class Indian communities. Uh, and when estates were opened in the early years, this is what they would play. Right? So you drum away the devils, and then you plant the trident, the spear of Kali, uh, or Muniswar, or Shiva, uh, extreme gods, right? Uh, um, so to lend that kind of protection. But if you go to Taipusam, and you asked a Taipusam devotee, someone carrying a kavadi and piercing himself and being accompanied by the Urumi Melum, what happens to you when you go into trance? Always the reply would be, the deity takes possession of me. Yeah? Amma Sudamaso, Murugan Sudamaso, take possession of me. You never get that in Klantan. It's the inverse. I am releasing something that comes out of me, right? It could be frustration, it could be anger, it could be something, it could be my moyang, whatever, but it, I am, it emerges from me. The difference is very simple. It's theology. Uh, for Muslims, possession is a whole other aspect. 
but it doesn't mean within a traditional context that you cannot allow what is latent within you to emerge out, right? So intellectually, I have always found the Malay ritual setting a lot more interesting in that there is so much more to say right, about things like the subconscious. Uh, of course, worded in very different ways, but essentially referring to the subconscious, uh, to aspects of the latent, uh, aspects of the hidden psychology. As compared to when I speak to fellow Kavadiists, because the answer is very simple. Amma took over. Lah. Right? Amma took over. What do you feel? Oh, I feel Amma. You know, um, you know, do you feel any pain? No, I don't feel any pain. Murga, murga. You know? Not making fun, I'm just telling you. That is the two different... So intellectually, uh, a lot more sophisticated in this sense. Uh, in the Hindu context, you could actually interrogate a great deal more. But you're not sure whether the performer or the actor, actor is able to articulate or has that kind of intellectual understanding about what they're going through. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of this has... Uh, but let, 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 let's show the Mark Yong. Mark Yong, ada kan? Okay, and then I'm going to wrap it up very quickly. Okay, those are some of the scenes. It goes on for a, a, a long time, sometimes for about an hour and a half, two. Uh, and uh, um, performers get into the state of great ecstasy uh, and then fall flat into complete exhaustion and then arise again in great ecstasy until they are literally worn out. Um, what we have been trying to do in Pusaka for a long time is to greatly intellectualize and offer a great deal more clarification of the kinds of possibilities that take place within such a setting. Because anybody viewing that, given the contemporary rhetoric, will say that is possession. Hantu, Jin, Jambalang, and all that kind of medievalist. Uh, uh, and the conversation ends. Uh, what then happens to psychotherapy, psychology? What happens to Freud, who got all of his stuff from this anyway, <laughs> in the first place? Uh, you know, uh, archetypes, uh, character archetypes are all there uh, in ritualistic uh, traditions. Uh, what are we then to make of the uh, intellectual tradition left behind by, sadly, mainly Western scholars? Uh, Carol Lederman, who did an amazing book on Mind Putri called uh, Taming the Winds of Desire. Uh, and very early in the 1950s, a great anthropologist, British anthropologist called Raymond Firth, you know, who talked about the politics of ritual in, in the state of Kelantan and the economics of ritual in the state of Kelantan. Uh, what would happen to Christian Jit, uh, you know, who wrote in the newspapers, but who, who provided a very incredible uh, picture of the array Right, array of, uh, of ritual and traditional artists uh, that existed. And then, of course, there's a, a great book by Tan Sui Beng uh, on Bangsawan, which is popular theatre, but gives you a very deep sense of how politics has invaded the cultural space. Mm? Um, but women play, again, play a very, very important role. And very often that space is created, one for memory, you know, but it's also a space where they beat up their husbands. Now, I'm not joking. So the husband is brought on, uh, onto the stage very often, uh, and attempts to seal up with the wife. And I guess all kinds of domestic, uh, domestically suppressed energies uh, are let out there. And uh, it's really quite marvelous to see a woman kick her husband in the backside and 
you know, he falls over and he tries to fight her and he can't seem to win, uh, which is really the kind of state of things in, in Kelantan, yeah? Even since 1990, right? Uh, try and tell a woman she can't stand in that counter and just stand another and you're going to get her handbag on your head. Um, now, the other very interesting um, uh, aspect of the ritualistic space is that ugly word called gender. Uh, in Klantan, it's just chae, you know, fluid, very fluid. Uh, and uh, one of our very interesting uh, experiences with Mind Putri and the ritual setting uh, at first uh, was um, uh, treating a trans person. Uh, we used to treat a trans woman uh, in the small town, uh, in a small village in Bacho. And one day we were called and said, you know, this person needs healing. Can you raise some funds and come and do a mind putri uh, with uh, um, two top putris? Uh, and um, we arrived there and uh, the patient was brought out, this woman, dressed as a woman, everything. Uh, but she had an incredibly striking look, a uh, very angular look. Hmm? Uh, and a bit was told to me about the fact that, you know, uh, her depression was caused by the fact that she couldn't bear children. And she had been married, married for 25 years and couldn't bear children. She goes into depressions. And we performed for the first two and a half hours or so. And then I told Pauline, I said, she has a very interesting look. Meanwhile, she had gotten up and she was, you know, making tea and uh, doing everything that women do. Uh, and later, uh, um, what I was thinking was proved right in that she was a trans woman. Uh, and, uh, you know, she had been so well looked after by the community, uh, accepted for what she believed herself to be in, in terms of the Naluri and Batin. Uh, and uh, participated and interacted very much as a woman in that community. But her depressions were based on the fact that she couldn't have children. And so we treated her for about three or four years, I think, on a regular basis, uh, uh, until our Toputri passed away, and then I don't know what, what, what has happened since. Um, but again, gender fluidity within the ritual context, uh, tremendously important. Um, identifying factor of what a ritual is for. And uh, in Mark Young, as you know, women play men's roles. And during particular comic scenes, men cross-dress uh, and perform women's roles. Um, and the point is, you know, to allow all of these energies, essentially, to not be suppressed, not cause disruption inside, but you cannot do it everywhere. But you just create a space in which that can be let out. Uh, very interestingly also is community support for people who are gender fluid. So uh, we have a great Mark Young actress. Her name is Meg Jha. Uh, and Meg Jha had a nephew uh, who was a trans person. Uh, and uh, she would come one day as a woman and then she would come the next day as a man, and then the next day as a woman, and you know, it goes on that way. And I asked Megja, I said, doesn't the... And you know, the entire community was very, very... I wouldn't even say accommodating because they didn't even need to try to be accommodating. It, it was just the way it was. So everybody just interacted that way. Uh, and I asked Megja, and he said, well, you know, that's his angin. That is his nature. You know, and we cannot disrupt the nature because then it will be disrupt him. And if you disrupt him, you'll disrupt all of us. Um, and it's just accepted. Uh, a lot of empathy, a lot of compassion, a lot of understanding. Uh, and this is very, very common in, in traditional Malay societies, traditional Southeast Asian societies. The great disruption, of course, was um, maybe certain kinds of Christian values brought by certain, uh, certain very clear ideas of gender and so on. Uh, and my argument with people always is, uh, I think it's very important to fight for all these rights, but they have to be fought with your firm 
with your foot firmly in a sense of your own history and identity. Uh, for thousands of years, people in Southeast Asia never had problems with trans people. In fact, regarded them as, you know, orang kayangan. Uh, not in the heavens, not in the earth, but the intermediaries uh, between heaven and earth. Uh, these are some of the uh, contexts. The last thing I think, there's a lot more, but the last thing I really want to address is the religious context. Um, there is a sense somehow uh, especially among uh, the Malay body politic today, um, that Malayness is just one thing. Yeah. Uh, that could be further, furthest from the truth. And if you want to try and understand the evolution of Malay politics, I think you must understand that the greatest assault on the Malay state of being has come from within. Uh, because politics requires uniformity and homogeneity and what is always termed as Malay unity. But culturally, the Malay is not, I wouldn't say, I don't want to use the word united, the Malay is heterogeneous. Where does the Malay begin and end? <laughs> on the East Coast? On the west coast, north, south, in the middle, in Perak, they speak three different dialects, just in the state of Perak alone. In Perlis, if you're from Kanga, it's very unlikely you can understand a person from Kuala Perlis. Hmm? Uh, Manora in Klantan is performed in two languages, Thai and Malay. Klantan, uh, Bahasa Klate, eh? so two. In Kedah, it is because it's a much more insulated tradition in Kedah. They only perform in Thai. In Penang, it is so mixed. They perform in Malay, in Siamese, in, in, in Thai, in Malay dialect Utara, eh? uh, and uh, in Hokkien. And then because it's so popular, they throw in English words also. Okay? So this notion of basically stricturing uh, a cultural being uh, because you want them to become a political being is one of the great disruptions, I think, in Malay culture uh, today. Uh, a lot of it today centers on religion because, of course, the biggest power play is happening in religion today. Uh, who commands the faithful? The royals? The politicians? The clerics? Who? Uh, and it is actually something that is going on uh, at, 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 at present. Um, when Carol Lederman uh, began her study, she looked and introduced a very interesting concept into the study of ritual theatre. Islamic humoralism. Okay. Uh, whereby one aspect of Sufism, which is humour, not very unlike Zen monks, huh? who say you practice all your life to reach enlightenment, but when it happens, it will be through a good joke. Yeah? Uh, or people who perform koans, Zen monks who perform koans on their knees for hours on end, for days on end, 48 hours, 62 hours. And uh, you know, if you fall asleep or you start to feel groggy, the Zen monk will come with a big stick and wall up you, hit you very hard at the back. Uh, and the belief, of course, is that that shock will shock you into enlightenment. It is the same with the mind putri. So there is a lot that is very intense. It's very, a lot that is very laconic. A lot that is very much rooted in pathos and melodrama. But then there is the whacking. They're always whacking the patient, you know? Whacking like that, and then with jokes, taunting, and so on, until and it's actually the whacking that gets the patient up, and then they start to to dance. Mm -hmm. uh, for many Oriental scholars, Richard Winstead being one, he wrote the most famous Malay book uh, uh, um, book on Malay uh, shamanism, uh, called the Malay Magician, uh, Shaman, Shaiva, 
and Sufi. Okay. Um, I have great admiration for Orientalist scholars, for the rigor of their scholarship. I have very little patience for their attitude. <laughs> and Winstead, like many others, saw the Malay world only as part of Greater India, just imitations of India. Uh, that is bullshit. Uh, there is so much of the indigenous right, that, that, that shapes uh, whatever Indian influence that has come. In fact, in the 1920s and 19, 1920s, when two great towering Indians came to Southeast Asia, went to Borobudur, they went to Bali, they went to all these places, their names were Rabindranath Tagore and Uday Shankar, the br elder brother of Ravi Shankar, uh, and they were telling all Indians to come to Southeast Asia to find your true self, <laughs> right? So very far away from this idea of Southeast Asia being uh, just uh, greater India. Um, but uh, his scholarship, his recording and documentation uh, is very, very uh, um, comprehensive and very, very good. But of course, the great realm in which this operates uh, is, is the religious realm. Mm? Uh, and it operates within the realm of mysticism, uh, Sufism, uh, and ilmu tasawuf. Okay? Uh, now, there's a very deep historical reason for this. Islam did not come to Southeast Asia through conquest. Mm? Uh, it also did not have a particular point in history in which it rooted itself. It came in a series of waves. It also, Islam didn't come with an established authority. It came through the journeys and, and uh, um, ventures of tradespeople, uh, and so they brought the Shafi'ite school. The Shafi'ite school has no firm place in any of the leading Islamic, historically Islamic important countries, none, right? The Shafi'i school is large and the largest because it belongs to all the diasporic communities. And uh, uh, within this whole operation of Mind Putri and Mak Yong and whatever not is essentially the concept, uh, all Muslims are Muslims, yes. All Muslims between believe in particular kind of tenets. Five pillars, yes. And after that, Muslims start to get very diverse. Hmm? And uh, Malays, of course, are rooted very, very deeply in the Ghazalite tradition, this tradition of Al-Ghazali. Uh, Malay Muslims are Ghazalite Muslims. Hmm? And of course, the Ghazalite principle, right at the end, the greatest achievement of his thinking, and he was just an incredible thinker, uh, was the fact that we reject reason. Hmm? In your uh, greater approach to God, you must reject reason. Uh, and this was his great book, uh, Countering the Philosophers, hmm? that after a certain realm, logic doesn't operate. Right? And only pure spirit and a direct relation to God operates. Right? And there are four sophistic I won't go into all those stuff, but, uh, um, you know, but hakikat, hakikat, real reality is that direct union, okay? You have shari'at, you have tariqat, you have, uh, you know, makrifat, and then that last. Um, <clears throat> very strange, right? These days it's safer for non-Muslim to say that than most Muslims. Um, so, um, just to conclude, <laughs> because there's a lot more, uh, there are, all kinds of aspects that are problematic for ritual today, language being the other one. Um, and I said this last time, I will end with this. Uh, and the moment you are able to appropriate and kill off language and its many, many meanings, uh, then you are become culturally really quite reductivist and stultified. Can someone give me the word for ritual in Malay? The official word today is ritual. Give me the, the word for ritual. 
Istiara, no, it's ceremony. No. Upachara, kind of formal. Samba? Samba is kind of right, but not really. It doesn't entail. A friend of mine told me the other day, oh, rasam, adat rasam. Adat rasam is not, it's practice. It's community practice. The word for ritual in Malay is puja. And puja does not mean worship alone. Yeah? Kami memuja Allah. That's one aspect of worship. But kami buat puja pantai. Commemoration. Memory and commemoration. Uh, and of course, you know, the language and a lot of these rituals have become extremely, extremely tentative these days because a large of them exist in the oral realm still. Right? Not in many other countries, like in Thailand, they've classicized. Indonesia, they've classicized. They brought it. No. We still exist in the oral realm. So it's a very, very authentic experience when you experience one of these things. But really, the subsuming of this, the politicization of this is actually operating most fundamentally at a linguistic level. Because once you rob the language of its many dimensions and give a word only one thing, right, uh, then the one who determines how that word is used is the one who kind of uh, controls it. Mm? Uh, so in many ways, so much of ritual today uh, that really preoccupied and that really kind of enveloped the Malay world uh, has today only become one thing, uh, how you perform your prayers. Uh, and uh, I think that has done a great deal to make the Malay cultural self so much more reductive. Mm? Uh, and uh, the problem is that there's very little intellectual interrogation of these things. A lot of it has been written, I've mentioned here, uh, but one of the aspects that a lot of scholars, a lot of writers, a lot of people have not entered in uh, is these aspects of the esoteric uh, and the philosophical. Uh, for these are philosophical dimensions uh, of uh, the Malay. Mm -hmm. I remember Swetanam talking about the fact that the Malays are very ruminative people. They're not ruminative people. They're deeply philosophical people. And those contemplations uh, exist. And, you know, the very important thing I've discovered about rituals is that rituals exist in the realm of the senses. And rituals are occasioned for senses to come alive. Anybody who performs yoga will know what this means. Lah. You get those bloody dead nerves working, you see. Uh, and this is what is occasion. But when the sense, senses, the nature of the senses become dangerous to the body politic because it is democratic, it is quite anarchic, it has a mind of its own, it's stubborn, it's rebellious, and when the point of ritual is for you to get up and dance, yeah, and that it's rooted very much in those uh, uh, highly, uh, um, in, in Malay aesthetics it's very pronounced, longing, yearning and need uh, is what occasions the ritual setting. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I think I've really gone on. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. Maybe one short ones. I wanted to get your uh, take on how have the rituals evolved with the younger generation? If you were to look at the you know, cosplay playing younger generation, do you see the rituals existing in some shape or form with this younger generation? Um, okay, uh, it's a very protracted problem, that one. Uh, it's a highly intellectual problem. Uh, and we have great young performers. Uh, I'm very proud, I think that's one of Posaka's great successes, that when I first entered the world you know, in the uh, early 1990s, uh, when the band had just been, proscription, was, proscription had just been introduced, there were about three dalangs, very old, one Manora performer. Uh, you know, today the traditions are actually thriving among the young. But the problem is literacy, right? So everybody wants to learn through reading and writing. 
They don't want to learn it in the old way of imbibing, you know. Uh, and I think the nature of our orality is very important because the nature of orality is not just cerebral. It is about the way you hear, the way you see, the way you touch, the way you, all these, all these, uh, all these kinds of, and the way you think, of course. Uh, but this is very absent among, among the young. Uh, so I'm always still very thrilled, uh, unlike the rest of my team, I'm the only one who worked with the older generation. So I know what it means when a grad Dalang graduates. You have to perform all those rituals and rites, and you have to perform the you know, uh, feeding of the spirits, feeding of the spirits, where they cut the, that last scene where they cut the, uh, the, 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 the screen, uh, and there's no difference between the wayang world and the real world. And then you have to swim across the river, collect your puppets, and drag them into, you know, all that is part of building muscle, uh, building muscle. It doesn't happen anymore. So as much as they are beautiful and animated performers, they even have problems remembering stories, you know, unless they are written down. So uh, I love my communities, but, you know, I have seen the, that last generation. So I see the... This is partly the fault of, of, of uh, oral masters as well. You know, oral masters never want to teach their students everything. So... Every time, you know, about 15% is taken away because I don't want him to challenge me, you see? Uh, so 15%, 15% through the generations, today we're left with very little. So the transition is, is, is you know, um, but uh, you get people experimenting with Star Wars, Wayang, and all that. All that is well and good, but it's not for me, and it is not Wayang, right? Uh, um, so those kinds of, um, uh, that kind of kitsch, for middle-class people who like to feel that they are getting a sense of authenticity of their own culture uh, is not what it's all about. Yes, sir. What do you think about um, what some might call as a watered-down or a more commercial version of Ma Yong? that you can you know, see it in Istana Budaya. What do you think of those type of performance where they don't really practice the full repertoire or disciplinary of, of, of the real Mak Yong and, and Mayim Putri? Does it disrupt uh, the, the history or do you think that it, it can be somewhat like an approachable version to, to the uh, modern society? Okay, this is a difficult question because I don't want to seem so negative. Uh, but the stuff in Istana Budaya is just rubbish. Eh? It's so poor, the quality is terrible and it's farcical. It's really farcical, and it's very insulting to the tradition. Uh, now, performers are very versatile. See, this is a, what we've inherited with, you know, the way we have managed our culture uh, since the 1970s uh, with the DASA, you know, National Cultural Congress and all those kinds of things. The National Cultural Congress had one, had one objective with the ritual arts, the traditional arts, with the ritual arts. It was to make the ritual arts traditional. Yeah? We make the ritual arts traditional. And a scholar I greatly admire, who, who did the, the main paper, whose name is Amin Sweeney, I, I, I greatly uh, respect and admire his scholarship, but I couldn't understand what the hell he was doing with this. Uh, and that he wanted to take ritual traditions out of their ritual context, make them traditional, and put them in mu museums. Okay. Um, now, there is an Indonesian writer. His name is Pramodya Anantator. Mm -hmm. And pa Pram had a wonderful book called Bukan Pasamalam. Mm -hmm. And Bukan Pasamalam is a book about how basically we don't need European inventions like the museum. Our museum is on the street. We're tropical people. Our culture is alive. It is not in boxes. Right? Uh, and I remember what pa Pram said during the pogrom, first pogrom of the Ch Chinese pogrom in 1955. And then he was arrested in under Sukarno, whom he admired. <laughs> but um, when the first Chinese pogrom took place, he wrote a, a long essay hmm, called Hua Kiao di Indonesia, the Chinese in Indonesia. And he said, if you believe the Chinese are indeed alien to Indonesian life, then please go to the nearest kraton or the palace, pick up the gongs and the gamelan sets 
that you love and venerate and throw them in the sea. Hmm? I've always wished that Malaysian writers would have this kind of guts to say this kind of thing. Um, because he was looking at a history of continuity. A continuous history that is very, very, you know, kind of um, um, immersed. And so Istana Budaya is really an in, in, inherited, just getting worse and worse in terms of quality. Uh, because people who do this in Istana Budaya don't actually know what the real Mark Yong is. They come from Aswara and they do all these kind of things. They are institutionalized Mark Yong. Now let me tell you something about Mark Yong. Mark Yong is damn bloody boring. It is damn bloody boring. It is very limited in its repertoire. You know, one move like this, one move like that, and then uh, go young a bit like this, and then it's over. What makes Mark Yong incredibly special? It is angin. <laughs> so tada angin, boring lah. <laughs> Right? Uh, it is the passion, it is the charisma. You know, I had a, we had a very rare male Mak Yong performer. His name was Pak Su Mat. Pak Su Mat was very feminine, just beautifully flawless, you know, in his femininity. But I always used to say that Pak Mat, you could put him on this lectern, or you could put him in a football stadium, he would draw the same kind of focus, right? Because the power is there. It's esoteric. It's something else, right? Um, but Mark Yong, without all of this stuff, is very boring. You know, I, I couldn't stomach it for more than 10 minutes, to be honest. So you must understand that. Otherwise, you know, uh, we become UNESCO chasers of UNESCO awards and things like that. But but uh, as long as these traditions don't exist on the ground, I'm not saying you cannot do that in, uh, you know, even Pusaka does choreographed performances. But we let the performers decide uh, how to choreograph it because they have the knowledge and they have the authority and they have the power. What is happening in Istana Budaya is dictated by bureaucrats. Right? So uh, if there's very little interest in uh, traditional or ritual culture, uh, it's because we have done it unto ourselves. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Um, if I heard correctly, you just once mentioned the word storytelling. So I would like uh, to ask you if you could enlighten us a bit more and to say uh, a few words more about storytelling in this traditional culture. What aspect of storytelling? Whichever you choose. <laughs> That's a very big topic. It could be a lecture on its own. Uh, it's all rooted in storytelling. Uh, but storytelling, essentially, one as fabulist, hmm, fables, uh, and then one as memory. And it's the interfacing of that which is mythical, uh, that which is fabulous, with that which is personal. Uh, that is very fascinating with storytelling. Also still largely oral. Many of these stories are not documented. And the stories often reveal psychological states, right? So when we talked about uh, the storytelling, you know, uh, certain stories fit certain personality types and personality archetypes. And those stories are played so that, you know, the performer or the patient uh, will be able to kind of get that aspect of their personalities, which is normally suppressed uh, uh, to be performed. Stories are also very interesting in the way that they are innovated. So if you look at the, uh, um, if you look at the Wayang Kulit, uh, you know, it comes from a Ramayanic tradition. Mm -hmm. A very interesting uh, journey that the Ramayanic tradition made, uh, which is overland. So all kinds of variations. Uh, and today, if you took the Malay Ramayana back to India, they'd be quite horrified as to the kind of, you know, uh, eccentricities of, uh, of, of, of uh, things. But take Wayang, for example. Storytelling becomes very innovative uh, in the sense that you have something called the trunk story, uh, the, the root story, uh, trunk, uh, trunk story, which is the Ramayan. 
right? So you know the general narrative of the Ramayana. Uh, but a really, really splendid dalang would be one who is able to create what they call chirita ranting or branch stories. So that from the trunk, you keep innovating with new and new stories. So stories that are compounded upon stories uh, is very reflective of the ingenuity of essentially a master performer. Anybody who comes, like in Indonesia, for example. In Indonesia, your authenticity to the original story is what is most important. If you came there with some variation of the Mahabharat, you know, they would be scandalized. Very Indian in that way. Okay, that kind of weight of, weight of history and genealogies that pound on people all the time. Um, whenever I go to conferences in India, you know, it's always that, you know, Hanuman, this 13th son, and uh, I said, no, in, in Malaysia, it's a lot more, lot looser. <laughs> uh, so that, I think, is quite a different between what you call uh, foundational cultures uh, and, you know, inventive or or improvisatory cultures. Yeah. Okay, I'm very tired. <laughs> Anybody want to ask one last thing very fast and then I go to Ping San? Yes. And um, they will shoo us out with a broom in, at six o'clock. Oh, hi, sorry. Just one last question. So, do you think that the newer generation can create their own ritual. Like, what's your thought on the newer generation do not want to associate themselves with history and past? What if they create their own ritual? What do you think on that? It's the most challenging question I've ever... <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I think uh, young people do. They do create their own rituals. Everybody creates their own rituals, but it's what kind of ritual we are talking about. Uh, there are aspects, I think, certain aspects of ritual are very important in continuity. There are other rituals that can be very inventive. Uh, and a lot of people write about them these days, you know. Uh, uh, rituals about, uh, you know, Emoticons. sorry? Emoticons, uh, cosplay is ritual. Cosplay is ritual, actually, in some kind of way. So they have all of that. Uh, but. Uh, Young people who are not interested in, I'm glad you said that, profess that too. Uh, young people who are not interested in history or want to create their own, own, own rituals. Uh, uh, well, they do. They do. I'm, I'm not being judgmental about it, but uh, I think aspects of history and routine are very, very crucial. Um, and on our side, but uh, maybe I end here, I mean, which young people are you talking about? Yeah, because young people from what I'm talking about, are going back to these rituals in kind of a big way. Okay? Uh, even as they are inventing their own rituals with their phones and things like that, they also realize that you know, there is a need to return, to discover a sense of where they come from and who they are. Um, which I think maybe, and I don't say this in any kind of pejorative way, I think people of certain other classes uh, can choose not to have those kinds of, of uh, longings. Does that make sense? But, but you ask me what do I think about it. I, I, I don't know, I would like to learn more about what young people's rituals are. I mean, I have rituals too. I mean, I only put on my left sock first and I'm very superstitious. Those are rituals also in a, in a, in a kind of sense. Uh, yeah, so. Thank you.